Thank you very much. Um, after that um, very nice uh, ride of optimism, I do not like my talk anymore <laughs> because um, I have to talk about nuclear power. So um, uh, this is a joint work with Caroline Fisher, who's here, who uh, you will hear in the afternoon, and Marie Ellen Hubert, who's at the uh, University of Rennes. And um, my goal is to, um, you know, sort of talk about nuclear power and the role of nuclear today, and then uh, try to tell you a little bit about uh, some preliminary results from a modeling exercise that we are trying to do, and we were still getting results last night, so it's very preliminary. And then sort of provide a longer uh, term perspective on nuclear, um, which, you know, might um, tie in well with the previous talk and others uh, today and yesterday. So here is your um, world electricity output by fuel in, uh, in 2013. And you can see, um, well, you still have that 800 pound gorilla called coal uh, supplying 42% of electricity. And as you know from before uh, and all the discussion we've had, Electricity is the sector where a lot of uh, changes could happen if you were to transit from fossil fuels to alternative uh, resources. If you look at hydro, that's 16%. Na there's natural gas, 22%. Nuclear is 11%. And if you think about the aggregate size of the electricity um, market in the world, it's about 23,000 terawatt hour. I'll talk a little bit about terawatt hour, 10 to the 12 uh, watt hours, I guess. Um, and um, oil is 4%, so not much oil is produced from electricity. This is actually, uh, I doubt if you can see it from the back, but um, essentially nuclear power plants in different countries and plants under construction. So maybe this picture is a little more readable. So you can see here, well, just go back one step. Um, there's about 380 gigawatt equivalent of nuclear capacity today and about 65 gigawatts that is under construction. So who are the big um, actors in this game? Well, again, it's China. So China has a lot of nuclear plants under construction. If you go back here, I think China has 24 plants out of a total of 67 plants that are at various stages of construction, including five in the United States. Uh, there is, uh, so here Russia also has relatively aggressive uh, nuclear um, plants under construction, India, about six. And then you have US and Korea and the UAE um, and, and other nations. So that's the number of reactors, uh, June 2015. So let me give you a little bit of nuclear power 101. Well, like I said before, current installed capacity is about 380 gigawatt equivalent. So if you, if you take this uh, capacity and run it you know, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, 52 weeks in the year, then you, you basically get per gigawatt, if you just do the sort of multiplication, you get about 8.76 terawatt hours. However, what we actually get from the 380 is about 2,400. So the efficiency is uh, about 70%. Um, in terms of generation. Now, uh, there are some studies, for example, by um, Lucas Davis and Catherine Wolfram uh, recently that show that in the US, the efficiencies are much higher. Uh, I guess in France, too, the efficiencies would be significant. Um, in the US, it's about 90, 95, 94%. Um, and um, so essentially, what you end up uh, getting is about 2,400. You know, in other developing countries, uh, nuclear uh, plants do not work as efficiently. Even in the United States, as this study uh, shows, the plants that, ha that have been deregulated perform better than the ones that, are, um, that have not been deregulated. So the average annual growth of nuclear capacity is about 14, 15 gigawatts. Um, the IEA projects that by 2040, you'll have about 767 compared to 380-odd gigawatts today. So what we did in our, in our sort of modeling exercise is, is take this sort of linear you know, interpolation between 2014 and 2040, and then say, well, how much of extra nuclear capacity are you going to, have, uh, are you going to get 
in the next you know, coming years, and it essentially boils down to about 95 terawatt, terawatt hours. So if you look at the you know, proportional sort of allocation of this capacity between different uh, countries, uh, well, we, what we did, again, to make our model tractable is to divide the world into three regions. Uh, China is one because a lot of things, as we heard in the last two days, uh, happen because of what's you know, going on in China, our Chinese uh, decisions and, and energy um, you know, plans. So China gets about 50% of that incremental nuclear capacity, and um, North America gets about 15%, and Rho, the rest of the world, gets about 35%. So that's how we allocate our um, plant capacity for nuclear um, in, the, in, the, um, in the coming years. So for China, this means um, you know, pretty significant annual growth of about 47 terawatt hours. Uh, if you look at 2014, Chinese nuclear output was about 124 terawatt hours. So about 37, 38%, I would guess. Um, well, there is another problem with nuclear, which is, uh, as we have seen in the United States, is that a lot of the plants are aging. So you can see here, um, years in operation on the x-axis, a number of reactors. And, you know, there are, uh, well, relatively few new nuclear uh, plants being brought um, into the pipeline. And there's tons of plants that are really old. Uh, of course, in the United States, plants that have uh, been operating for 30, 40 years have had to go through a major exercise, uh, meet uh, you know, uh, federal standards and so forth to be re-licensed for another 30, 40 years. So uh, you, know, you have to upgrade and so forth. And that is, again, a big challenge uh, faced by the, by the nuclear industry, or would be in the years to come. How do you, uh, do you let these plants die, as some countries have done? Uh, or do you, uh, you know, um, improve them and bring them uh, and run them again for another four, three or four decades. So here is your carbon content uh, for different you know, fossil fuels. We know this story very well. Coal generates more carbon than oil and natural gas. And that is uh, in our model. I'm going to begin, begin talking a little bit about our model and the sort of preliminary attempt to get some idea of the role of nuclear uh, in, the, in the future in terms of carbon emissions and, and possible pro-nuclear policies. Um, so, um, here, so what basically we have a very simple idea here. We could do a, a whole bunch of scenarios. We just take a nuclear uh, sort of planned capacity expansion like the one I mentioned to you and compare it to a nuclear freeze. So suppose we all become Germany and Japan. Well, not quite Japan, but uh, more like Germany, and say, no more nuclear, let's just stop and keep it constant at 380-odd gigawatt uh, equivalent, how, what, how would that impact sort of global allocation, regional allocation of different resources for energy? So you know, we are looking at primarily things like coal use, renewable use, carbon emissions, and leakage between countries, um, which uh, often uh, turns out to be quite important. And here again, uh, you can see the numbers for China are especially interesting, so we focus on Chinese energy use. Well, how does this model work? Um, within economics, uh, you know, Nordhaus did a model in the 1970s looking at the effect of OPEC oil prices, a sort of partial equilibrium model where we only look at the energy sector divided into um, residential, transport, commercial energy, and then electricity um, that is used uh, you know, in different sectors, uh, end use sectors. So it's a partial equilibrium model. We do not consider what happens beyond energy. And then we have these three regions I described to you. North America has US, Canada, Mexico. Uh, rest of the world has the EU, um, Russia, India. So some big, big actors there. And energy inputs are all the re major resources. So coal, oil, natural gas. We aggregate renewable energy. I'll talk a little bit about that issue. Mm, so, you know, renewable energy could be hydro, biomass, um, you know, um, solar and wind, as we heard so much about uh, just now. And um, then we have nuclear power. And then the energy consuming sectors are those at the end. So this is how the schematic looks like. Essentially, you convert these resources. These resources come at some cost of extraction and refining and so forth. And then you convert them at some cost to the electric or non-electric uh, sort of use. 
And then finally, you convert them to final energy. There may be cost and efficiency losses uh, between each of these stages. So, um, so here is a typical sort of energy supply curve. Uh, you know, we have upward sloping curves in each region. So here, in this model, we have had to um, go from the country level to aggregate at the regional level. Uh, and the costs are um, you know, rising as you extract more. But these costs may also um, be impacted by learning by doing. So obviously, like we saw, uh, just, uh, we heard just now, there may be major learning by doing effects as the size of the market expands, that these costs might reduce. And that is especially important in things like renewables, but it's also important for um, fossil fuel resources, for example. Uh, imagine more efficient cars being produced, and that means that one gallon of oil uh, goes farther in terms of you know, miles traveled. So we had to, uh, you know, one reason I have preliminary results is because we had to play around a lot to get the, ba the model to replicate base year you know, numbers with these three regions. And essentially, we have transport costs that equal baseline price differential. So we, ha we had to uh, account for export and import. And the way we do it is, is by uh, putting in transport costs. And then we have a final energy production uh, equation. So here are some typical costs. I'm just not going to talk too much about the model. It's preliminary, but just to give you an idea. You can see th these are extraction costs and for different regions. And you can see coal is uh, pretty low cost in North America relative to China, which has higher cost. And, um, and oil, obviously, is similar for North America, China, but cheaper for raw with all the Middle Eastern countries and so forth. Gas is, again, uh, cheaper for um, you know, the United States pr primarily in North America, and then more expensive for China and, and sort of moderate uh, for Rho. Um, now, if you look at the cost of supplying electricity by region, region and fuel, here actually what you see is a, uh, um, you know, a bit of the optimistic message we just heard. Uh, look at the cost of renewables versus um, you know, other resources like coal and gas and nuclear for different regions. And this is in dollars per megawatt hour. And you can see renewables look really good. In, in, for the case of China especially, you know, $30 per megawatt hour relative to uh, nuclear, which is 50. Now the problem here is, of course, um, uh, you know, what renewable are we talking about? Are we talking about hydro? Uh, again, we, that opens a whole can of worms in terms of you know, all the uh, land use issues, settlement, and what have you, capacity, limited capacity of hydro. So when you have large um, expansion in each of these sectors, maybe some of these costs will go up because the marginal costs will, will increase. And uh, so here is our sectoral demand as a function of regional GDP and the price of energy. So what we do is we aggregate uh, region, uh, the country GDP into regional GDP. And uh, so demand is a function of some constant and the price in that sector, and then um, some measure of regional GDP. Uh, you can do it either GDP per capita and add population, which we did in a previous uh, uh, paper, and you know, include population growth exogenously in the model, or you can use estimates for um, you know, for GDP for each region. So here is our annual income data by region, and you can see again that uh, the significant, well, North America, not much uh, income growth projected, uh, you know, by other people, uh, EIA, for example, but uh, China, big, uh, as everyone knows, and uh, Rho is also pretty significant. So those drive some of these some of these uh, results. Um, so, uh, you know, moratorium on nuclear capacity and planned nuclear growth are the only two things we talk about. So here is your planned nuclear growth, like I mentioned, the interpolation uh, with the projections. And you can see North America, some growth in nuclear, but China is com coming from a small base, and, um, and Rho is also a reasonable uh, growth rate. Um, so I just go through this here. So what the other sort of exercise we do is we say, well, you know, we are looking at nuclear, no nuclear, but we don't have any carbon targets. So what we do is we impose a carbon target, uh, essentially a carbon tax with nuclear growth. So can we impose a $50 per ton of, um, you know, constant $2,005 per ton of CO2, um, which obviously um, is, is constant in present value terms, in, uh, in the model and see what uh, difference does it make between freezing nuclear capacity and letting it grow at planned, planned uh, rates. And um, you know, hopefully you can see this. Um, so here is our 
um, you know, the, the interesting numbers are on the, in the right, and you can see the emission reductions, and this is a comparison between planned nuclear with carbon tax and without carbon tax. So with, with, with carbon tax, obviously, uh, you know, uh, you, have to, um, you have to reduce uh, for, you know, fossil fuel use that is carbon intensive. So you can see that China reduces by about 22% in 2030. So this is, these are all 2030 numbers with and without uh, carbon tax. And uh, Rho also uh, has to um, you know, reduce emissions, annual emissions, by about 20%, and North America by 15%. And that's the kind of story we would like to see uh, happen um, with the carbon tax. Um, so here is a, a comparison between the, you know, just looking at the electricity sector and um, in 2011 and what happens in 2030. So like I said earlier, you can see in 2011, a lot of renewables, a lot of coal, 79%, sort of, uh, and it's, uh, you know, the numbers are not too far off today, and uh, nuclear is small and gas is small in China. So that's sort of the harsh reality of it. Uh, but here is your, um, you know, comparison in 2030 of different, uh, the, the sort of different mix of fossil fuels. So you can see at the bottom is planned nuclear with the emissions target and the planned nuclear with no emissions target in the middle, and then on the top, you have nuclear freeze and no emissions target. So, um, you know, the top two um, lines are, uh, you know, without any emissions target. So you can see that with and with, without nuclear, if you do not impose a carbon tax, well, some things happen. I mean, obviously, nu in China, nuclear share goes up from 2%, which is today, to about 14% in, in, in under, you know, planned nuclear. But now how is it, what is it displacing? Well, it's displacing some renewables, actually. So, you know, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, given the cost structure, you, if you, if, uh, you know, if you do not have, if you freeze nuclear expansion in China, what you might see ultimately, which is, a good, which is I think, good news, is that you'll see more, a larger share of renewables. Um, you also actually, um, because of nuclear, well, the, the bad thing is that you're displacing from renewables. The good thing is you're also reducing some coal use. And um, not much is uh, happening to uh, natural gas. And I think Marty asked this question before and um, uh, in, in Kathleen's session. Well, how much gas can, can, uh, will, will China be able to extract? And there may be some serious questions there in terms of, you know, they, they do have a huge potential. They have the biggest uh, reserves uh, more than the United States, but it's not clear how much uh, China will extract in, in 2030, at least in our model, unless some major technological uh, adaptation occurs. Uh, so here is your, you know, 47% in, in um, the, uh, I mean, now when you apply the carbon target, nuclear becomes, uh, I'm sorry, renewables become big. 47% of the electricity supply comes from nuclear, and that's a, that's a nice, uh, nice number uh, if you're a pro, pro uh, renewables. And 37% with coal. So we can see that carbon tax really works in this, in this uh, framework. Uh, so what, what about output? Now I showed you the shares, but notice if you do not impose a carbon uh, tax, well, with, with uh, no emissions target and planned nuclear at the size of the electricity sector actually increases some. And uh, because the costs are lower and the, you know, the demand increases. But um, what happens in China is if you go from 8,000 terawatt hours to about 6,000 terawatt hours under carbon tax. So what you want to do is not just worry about, obviously, the mix, but also the, the uh, size of the electricity sector. And, uh, and that comes down about 30%. Uh, so here is your United, uh, United States. And you can see again that uh, coal is 40 percent, uh, renewables 20 percent, and, and 5,000 terawatt hours. The size of the electricity sector in China becomes bigger over time and becomes the leading energy consuming uh, electricity sector, at least in the, in the world in 2030. But here is your numbers for the United States. Not much uh, changes except under a carbon tax you're, when your renewable share uh, goes up quite a bit and you have <coughs> sorry high um, gas use in the United States, as we know. So uh, again, the size of the sector does not decline too much in the US with the carbon tax. 
Uh, rho is uh, sort of moderate sensitive between the two cases. And you can see in rho also you have high renewables and, and a reasonable share of coal, but more uh, equitably distributed, so to speak, between the different resources. And again, here you can see coal use declines from 20 to 12 percent, and, uh, and nuclear takes a 16 percent share. Okay, um, there is also some decline in the electricity output in row under carbon tax, as we would expect. Well, global emissions decline by about 18 uh, percent in the scenario without tax. So, uh, with tax. So. What are the main sort of takeaways from this exercise? Like I said, it's a really preliminary, uh, it's preliminary work. Um, well, obviously we get big reductions in coal use, but only with uh, carbon tax. I mean, in China, for example, uh, nuclear is just too small uh, to make some big impacts. Um, uh, to, to deliver a sort of uh, clean energy uh, alone. It needs a carbon tax or some sort of target to be able to deliver more in terms of uh, renewable share. And, and it's surprising that renewables do, um, you know, occupy a big share uh, under these scenarios. Gas share does not budge, at least not in China, and big impacts in China and Rho. So here is your, well, we need to do some more work. We need to, um, you know, get cost estimates of these tax policies and pro-nuclear policies. Um, the question I have is, well, you know, are, are these large shares of renewables realistic? What renewable are we talking about? Is this hydro? Is it biofuels? Is it, um, is it solar and wind? Uh, and what may be their own uh, impacts? Um, and, and, you know, some of these, uh, some of these uh, renewables may have some problems. Um, so we need to disaggregate in this model. Uh, not only disaggregate uh, the renewables, but also disaggregate across regions. Uh, maybe split a row into EU and Russia and India, and because the Russia and India have aggressive nuclear uh, programs, how uh, will these old plants be replaced, uh, if at all? That's an important question. The other thing I think uh, came out really uh, this morning and, and the last talk is the you know learning in other technologies. So there is nuclear learning in renewables, but there's also learning in nuclear. And, and if you look, uh, look at the literature. You know, some of these new designs uh, that do, um, they're much better at, uh, you know, damage control if, the, if the, uh, the hot core inside melts and so forth. Um, graphite cooled reactors and so forth. So unless, well, the problem is, you know, as we just heard, if, the, if nuclear is not being used, you will not get significant uh, R&D and learning in that sector. So that is tied to the uh, new nuclear plants uh, being operated and installed, so that will provide incentives to firms to come out with better technologies. Um, we did a study um, uh, when Roger and Nick Stern organized a conference some years ago, uh, and this was sort of um, based on Kyoto targets, and we found that um, half, you know, the nuclear could meet half the cost of meeting Kyoto targets. Um, and what's interesting today, and this is again, you know, things are so dynamic in this sector, that I don't think this, these conclusions would hold today, because at that time, nuclear was replacing coal and, and so forth. But, um, but now, you know, obviously with solar and wind, uh, there's, a new, uh, there's a new game in town. And uh, so the role of nuclear in mitigating you know, carbon targets at, at lower cost may be questionable. I want to end with some just uh, two uh, pictures. So one is uranium prices. What are happening with you know, obviously nuclear has, you know, not expanded um, as we have expected or maybe 10, 15 years ago. And you can see there, there was a peak in uranium prices. They have fallen uh, quite a bit. I mean, it's about, you know, $80, uh, $90 a kilo. Um, and um, so they, they are not going up. There was a concern that a significant proliferation of nuclear for civilian use would trigger an increase in uranium prices because uranium is a non-renewable resource. And, um, well, not sure if that is going to happen. But here is the other picture, which is, look at the difference between, this is time on the x-axis, and uranium supply from mines and uranium consumption. Those are the two top lines, uh, civilian power demand and, and naval demand, military demand. So if you look at the top line, that's the aggregate demand. How much of it is supplied by mines? So you see that big white area in the middle? That's basically um, the former Soviet Union and the United States agreeing to dismantle bombs. So if you dismantle nuclear bombs, you get 25 times more uranium 
and that depressed uh, prices for a long time in the, in the market. Um, I'm told that there are you know, 45,000 bombs waiting in arsenals, I guess, and only 5,000 have been dismantled. We, we don't need that many bombs to destroy the planet. Uh, only a few are enough. So um, you know, if there's more disarmament treaties, you will probably see significant supply of uranium. That might drive down prices quite a bit, although capital costs are the big part of uh, nuclear generation, not so much, uh, not so much variable costs. And um, so the, what's the, again, uh, the, the bottom line is that nuclear will be a major fuel. Uh, it, it may not be the panacea for you know, solving the world's uh, clean energy problem. And, um, you know, and, and you know, we, I guess we have to decide uh, how we want to approach, uh, you know, uh, how we want to think of nuclear policy. Uh, are we going to let these plants die or continue to uh, live with a bunch of plants that are old and, and may have some, some issues down the road? Thank you.